Welcome everyone. I'm joined today by Yeva Hyusyan, the co-founder and CEO of SoloLearn, a free-to-use platform that teaches coding and programming languages. SoloLearn was developed here in Armenia and now serves millions of users worldwide. Before starting SoloLearn, Yeva worked with Microsoft and USAID. Yeva, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, to start, can you just tell us a bit about yourself and your journey to start Solo Learn? What was your motivation, and how exactly does uh, Solo Learn work? What do users get from it? Yeah, I, I, I like to joke. I've had two lives, kind of one pre-IT world, and the other one is post-IT world. Uh, I worked for like USAID. Prior to that, we were working on implementing the World Bank project, so pretty much the development assistance world. Well, which gave me a lot of experience and exposure to pretty much every sector of economy. But my husband always worked in tech and we were surrounded by him, like by his friends who were also kind of in tech. And I was always jealous to see like how fast, you know, things happen and how dynamic the sector is and you know what is happening in there. So when I was given an opportunity to start running the Microsoft Innovation Center, and it was the very first accelerator that we built in the region, I think that was like, I just jumped at it because like, development sector is fine. I mean, development assistance sector is fine, but then tech is, is, is very different and pretty much everything is becoming tech in the world. So. Yeah, and, and that's the second part of my life, which has been in tech. We built the Startup Accelerator. We built the first bootcamp program in Armenia. We called it an internship program because the coding bootcamp term didn't exist at the time. It was back in 2011. And basically the founding team of the Microsoft Innovation Center is the founding team of SoloLearn as well. So yeah, SoloLearn, I mean, we were helping different uh, groups of students to build their ideas, market them, kind of, you know, like grow their businesses. And then at some time we realized that we're kind of ready to build our own. And that's how Solar started. It started as a very simple app. Like one thing, one, one principle that we had in the very beginning, like we're going mobile because that's much more accessible, kind of you can reach users everywhere in the world versus like PCs were still kind of I mean, not limited, but in some areas of the world, like the access wasn't as universal. So, and the second principle we had that it had to be bite-sized because we strongly believe that learning as an industry transforms as well. And the traditional kind of forced instructor centric learning is in the past. Learning should be as effortless as kind of taking a shower or like it, it should be part of your daily routine. And so we started with a bite-sized, you know, like very easy to complete lessons. We would put fragments of YouTube videos into a course, like into a curriculum, and we would kind of build a course that way. We had very early traction, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of users in a matter of months. But I mean, it has taken us like many years to improve the platform and there is still a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. And so if, uh, if I'm a user of SoloLearn, just in general, what is my experience going to be? What exactly can I do with the platform? Ah, that's a very good question. So there was like the inflow of edtech, like early platforms like Coursera, Udemy, and you've heard many other names. And what they did is they put the content online. Basically the content from the best instructors, best universities kind of became available to the population at large at a much lower price point. But what we realized is that content alone is not learning. Learning is much bigger than just consuming a content because if content were learning by reading a book, you would become a professional, but that's not the case. So from early days, just following our users' interactions on the platform, we kind of have been building the learning experience per se, which means you learn, you code, because if, especially in the coding world or in any like STEM area or in any area of learning, unless you practice kind of like whatever you read is useless, there is a lot of community interaction. So you get stuck. There is somebody on the platform that kind of is going to help you out or you have a question, you get an answer within minutes. So the community is like real. It's not just a forum on the side. And yeah, and then you go through, you know, like, many different kinds of practice exercises as you learn, like from very simple, you know, to like solving real use case problems on the platform. 
So I think that's the experience in a nutshell. So uh, what challenges did you have taking SoloLearn from the startup that it was to the global company that it is today? I think it's still a startup, maybe a little bigger. Uh, and, and the challenges kind of, you know, change with every next stage you, you face. But the biggest challenge is kind of, you know, where you are going and, and never give up. Because I think that's the mindset and that's the, you know, like the, you know, the, the big picture vision and also being able to execute within that vision, I think, are the two like most important things that like differentiate the companies that even eventually succeed from the ones that kind of fail in, in the middle. It's not about the idea. It's not about like what product you have at the moment. It's about, you know, how, how big you're thinking. And it's also about the ability of the team to kind of persevere and, and you know, like go to the next stage. Because yeah, you're right. Like every next stage brings very new challenges. Mm -hmm. And especially in my case, as, as, a, as the first time founder, you kind of do not have any experience like, in terms of how to address them. And your ability to learn fast and you know, align the team around those and kind of you know, move to the next stage becomes like, super important. And having the right team, people on the team is, is the second kind of most important thing because there is no one who can do it alone. Like, Maybe there are some, but <laughs> I don't believe in individual work. I'm a big believer in kind of teams and team spirit and, you know, getting things done because the more, like, the bigger your group of strong individuals is, the, the, the higher kind of your, like, combined capacity and, and your chances to succeed, basically. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of continuing on that subject, uh, I want to take a bit of a step back and, and talk about SoloLearn's place within the broader IT scene mm -hmm. here. So as we all know, Armenia produces so much engineering talent, tech talent. Uh, Armenia is always boasting about its tech industry, its startups. Uh, but the reality is that no IT company is in the list of the biggest 50 taxpayers here. Even Pixar isn't in the top 50. So I'm wondering, based on your experience, why do you think that is? What's holding Armenian IT companies back? Uh, I think if you look at the taxpayers list, it's very much it, 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 it's very much dependent on the number of people that work in a particular company. Like compared to mining industry, for example, we employ much fewer people. And although we pay more like to an individual, but then the total number of our employees is usually much lower because we can do more with less. So I think that's probably is the primary reason that we are kind of, but then if you look at the value that sector creates and also, you know, like, uh, and, and, and also the, 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 and not only in Armenia, basically the worldwide, I think that's a very different story. Sure. If you compare the productivity of an employee, like in an IT company versus to any other, like banking, mining, and I think these are the two biggest, right? Like, sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and to that point, even if these IT companies are not showing up in the list of the biggest taxpayers or have the most employees, they are still playing an outsized influence in the economy here. So I'm wondering, uh, in your view, and especially since uh, you said 2011 when, when everything was starting, how has the IT scene changed the, the life of the country, if you can say so? I think there are two worlds in Armenia, the IT kind of world, which lives a much better life. You know, they are more satisfied with their jobs because they are part of the global world as well, which is very important because no tech company can exist in silo today. I mean, it's, it, unless you're very small and solving a very specific Armenian problem, mm -hmm. and there are not many of those then you kind of, and, and, and then there is everybody else, unfortunately. The good news for Armenia is that the world is moving towards tech. And I think as a country, we have an unprecedented opportunity to play a bigger role in the world. But we need to also realize that we'll need to make some steps, you know, to get there in terms of like training our engineers better, for example, or, you know, like bringing even more companies into Armenia, you know, and then like also understanding what the competitive edge of Armenian tech is versus, you know, the world, because IT is a very broad term, like, 
and engineering is even like a broader ter term. So what are we good at, you know, and, and what, what are our, you know, like unique differentiators that will let us, allow us to play the role in the world economy in the longer term. So I think these are the questions that we need to like think about and, and also start addressing kind of in the near future if we want to keep that, you know, because right now, like due to like some political and economic developments, I think we're seeing a, a boom in the number of companies in Armenia. But for example, that boom comes with, you know, like raising salaries which makes competing on a cost basis almost impossible. Mm -hmm. Today we pay the same salary to an engineer in Europe and to an engineer in Armenia. So our engineers better be good, you know, or like better at something, you know, if we want to like maintain that competitive edge. So, so yeah, it's all great and awesome. And, and I think if we didn't have tech, we would have been in a very bad place. But I think it's not that we kind of have figured it all out and, and everything is rosy and like there are rainbows and unicorns and <laughs> still work needs to be done. So in your opinion, what are some of those comparative advantages? Where is Armenia's strength? Uh, I think the product culture, just based on a number of success stories, which were instrumental in a small society, Armenia is like Pixar, it has become a unicorn or you know, service title is founded by Armenians. I think that plays a role. And I think like Armenians are entrepreneurial. So these two things, like you can succeed as a businessman, but in a tech sector, I think that's that has been an advantage. Doesn't mean other countries don't have it, but like in Europe, people are much more relaxed and happy and you know, they don't want to take that many risks. I think we're hungrier here in this part of the world. So I think that has been kind of a differentiator and probably worth investing it. And also, uh, depends on which part of the world we compare Armenia to, right? Like if you compare it to the US, we can, never kind of out compete them in terms of the experience and the number of companies and all those things. But like, if you look uh, at Armenia, like as compared to the neighboring countries, for example, I think the number of companies, tech companies we have per persona is much higher. And that means experience, that means, you know, like kind of best practices and, 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 and yeah, so. In the like smaller region, I think that's another competitive advantage. Too. Yeah, absolutely. So, what advice would you have for people, either in Armenia here who want to follow your path and get involved, or uh, people outside of Armenia who want to to come here or to get involved in some way? Uh, I mean, the, the most important thing is to make sure that you really want it and that you really enjoy it and that and you enjoy it as much as that, that like you enjoy it a lot, like to the extent that you will be willing to cope with very big challenges on the way. Uh, I don't believe you can do it if you don't really like, you know, love what you do, because like that love for building something for the world should be there. So I think that's the must have that needs to happen with every company's success. The second kind of thing is like based on experience, like have the best team possible and the best team possible changes with the, you know, like with the evolution of the company. Like in early days, you need people who can build things fast, you know, later on, you need people who can build systems, who can, you know, like align people around the culture and, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's a very different set of challenges. So I think that's the second most important thing. And the third thing is just don't be afraid, like try it, do it, make mistakes, you know, learn, iterate fast. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, on that note, Eva, thank you again very much for your time. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us on CivilNet.